So the German elections happened over the weekend. Uh, you know, intelligently, they have their elections on Sundays. Right? It's like, oh, we can't do that here. That's just like, that makes too much sense. Uh, but, you know, they have their elections on Sundays. And uh, some interesting things. I, I just want to speak to this because uh, it, it, I think, if nothing else, the coverage in this country of the German election super emphasizes how highly informed and educated both the American public and the American media are about the United States, about what liberal versus conservative or progressive versus uh, conservative means in the United States or versus around the world. Uh, first of all, you know, here's one little, now this is a non-binding referendum. It, it, it didn't change anything, but it was the will of the people. In Berlin, they had a vote on whether to, to uh, buy from, at market rates, buy from these giant real estate developers hundreds of thousands of apartments in Berlin. And instead of having them run on a for-profit basis where, you know, you get the highest rent you possibly can out of them, which is driving up rent prices in Berlin, and, and there's a real housing crisis in the city of around five or six million people. It's a major city. Instead, what they voted for, again, non-binding, what they voted for was for the government of Berlin to buy these housing units, these apart, mostly apartments, from these uh, two or three very, very large companies. The, the largest is company uh, Deutsche Wohnen, uh, Wohnen uh, which uh, owns 113,000 units, to buy them and then make them available as low-income housing. And... It won 56.4 to 39%, which, I mean, just having something like that on the ballot in the United States is relatively inconceivable. But this is what happened in Germany. And the, the media coverage increasingly in the United States the media coverage in the United States that you know we're being subject to about the German election is that Angela Merkel is a moderate to a conservative and that she's being replaced by somebody who's a little bit more liberal. Which kind of makes you think that Angela Merkel, who has uh, ruled uh, Germany for, you know, been the chancellor of Germany for, I believe, 16 years, and is beloved by Germans, by and large, that she must be sort of like, if she's a conservative, she must be sort of like Mitch McConnell, or maybe if she's a reasonable conservative like George W. Bush or, or Ronald Reagan. But think about this for a minute. This woman, Angela Merkel, invited over a million refugees into Germany, came out before the German, which was very unpopular, this was back about five, six years ago during the Syrian refugee crisis when they were filling up Greece and Turkey. And she came out and she said, we rebuilt after World War II. We recovered after the shock of Nazism. We have made it through the, 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 the crash of 2008. We reunified this country, East and West Germany and East and West Berlin. We can do this. I forget the German word, something like Wirtschaft allein or something like that. You know, we can all do this. We can do this. And the German people came together behind her and they brought in over a million refugees in a country of, what, I think 35 million people? Maybe it's 53, but, you know, it's a, it's a fraction of the United States. This, this would be like, you know, five, six, seven million refugees suddenly coming into the United States. And yet she's fabulously popular. This is a country where every company with over a thousand employees, 50% of their board of directors has to be made up of union members. This is a country where everybody has health care and nobody goes broke because somebody gets sick. 
This is a country where there is no student debt unless you want to attend, you know, a, a, a fancy schmancy university, uh, typically outside the country. Germany is a country that is already to the left of Bernie Sanders. And the fact that Germans want to kind of keep it that way is somehow described as conservative or moderate. This is a country where there is low income housing and in the and in Berlin where there isn't low income or there isn't enough low income housing. The people just voted 56 to 39 percent to nationalize housing. To say to these companies, you know, we're taking it by eminent domain. We'll pay you for it, of course, but we're going to take it. And we're calling this moderate? As if it's like Ronald Reagan? Or George W. Bush? Or we're calling it conservative like it's Donald Trump or Mitch McConnell? We are so far so friggin far behind the rest of the developed world that we don't even have language for it. And, and in the United States, it's like, you know, we just, we have no way to even report on this. The, the you know, the largest divide, I remember when I was doing this show in Denmark, and I was debating, I, I had asked Danish Radio, they're, they're the NPR of Denmark, uh, loaned us a studio for a week or two, as I recall. I, I think it was a week, it might have been two. Louise and I were there together. In fact, on our Saturday uh, Hartman report, I, I put a picture of the two of us. It was right after we'd gotten there, it was a long flight. My eyes were a little bloodshot from not sleeping on the plane. But in any case, um, I was in the studios of Danish Radio and I had on, and I had asked the producer, I, you know, I love to debate conservatives. So, oh, Joe Biden is getting his booster shot on live TV right now, by the way, just FYI. Um, and so I asked the producers, get me some conservative politicians. And they got me a couple of members of parliament who were the most conservative. And so I get one of them on and I say, boy, you're a conservative. You must love this. Na you must hate this national health care system, right? And he's like, what, are you crazy? Why would, I want, why would I want to do away with the national health care system? It's the cheapest, most efficient way to do it. Those are, those are conservative values. And so I'm like, well, you must hate the fact that uh, Denmark has closed off like 10 or 20 percent of their streets, Copenhagen rather, uh, and uh, turned them over to bicycles only. You know, that sounds like big government overreach, doesn't it? He's like, what, are you crazy? That's going to lower my taxes. I'm like, how does that lower your taxes? And he's like, well, you know, it's, uh, you know, our taxes pay for our health care. And if more people ride their bikes to work, we're going to have fewer heart attacks and strokes. And my health care tax bill is going to go down. How is that not conservative? And I'm like, well, then what is it that makes you a conservative? And he's like, Denmark's for Danes. In other words, we don't, we don't want people who don't have Danish ancestry in the country. Ethno-nationalism. That's what conservative typically means in most of Europe. Now, there are certainly some, you know, neoliberals in Europe as well, which is kind of a whole other topic. And Brexit is really showing those cracks. But basically, the American press does us a massive disservice when they characterize politicians like Angela Merkel as conservative or even as moderate as if that's the case by American standards. Yes, Germans consider her conservative or moderate. She's going up against the Greens. The Greens, you know, she's like, let's make a 20-year transition to no fossil fuels. And the Greens are like, no, let's make a three-year transition. But that doesn't mean that by American standards she's moderate. We just have no friggin' understanding of how the rest of the world works. And it serves people like Mitch McConnell and Donald Trump really well because we think our politics are normal. And they're not. Our politics are going the way of, of Brazil and Russia and Turkey very, very rapidly. And Hungary. I mean, if you want to look at a European country, Hungary has been there before us. Did you see CPAC is going to be in Hungary next year? Hey, go to where the dictators are.